안녕하세요. 안녕하세요. 오늘 기분 어때요? 좋아십니까? 많이 더워네. Hello, my name is Lashawn Thomas, and I live here in Seoul, in South Korea, for the summer. And I am not an English teacher. I am not in the military. I am not a professor or a rapper. And although to some of you I may look pretty tall standing up here, I am not very good at basketball. I am not any of those things. This is what I do. I'm a producer and director for animated content for television in Hollywood, California. What I basically do is make cartoons for TV. Now, some of you may be familiar with the idea of cartoons on TV. I hope so. And some of you may be familiar with cartoons on TV in my country, like this show. We all know what this is, right? The Simpsons is one of my favorite shows, and it's still running in America right now. Or how about this character? We all know this guy, right? Very popular show in America. Or how about this guy? We all know Batman. But what some of us may not know is that these three shows that I've just shown you are not animated in America by Americans. These three shows that you just saw are animated here in South Korea by South Koreans. In fact, about up to 85% of all animated television shows in America are animated here in South Korea. And India, and some places in China. But for the most part, we send all of our animation here for action shows. Now, there are three stages in making an animated television show in America. There's pre-production main production, and post-production. Pre-production is our job, the Americans. We come up with the story. We make the idea. We find the voice actors and the talent. We get the artists to come in, and we design, and we design the characters and the storyboards and the props. But we don't animate these shows. The animation is done here. Now, the part of main production is done here, and that means that once the animation is done, it comes back to us at the third stage, post-production, which means that we take what the Koreans have done, 
edit it, mix it, put sound effects and music, and put it on television. Now, main production is what we like to call in America as outsourcing. And outsourcing is one of the most integral parts of American animated television for the better half of about 25 years. Koreans have been animating American shows for about close to 30 years. And many of you might not have known that. So as a kid, I always loved watching cartoons. And you know, I'd watch cartoons as a kid. I've always you know, thought I was a talented little kid. I'd make my own characters and want to make the shows. And someday, I'd hope that I'd make my own animated show. And as I got older, my skills got better. And I developed, and I started to attract the attention of popular animation studios. And they wanted to hire me. So I got the job. Perfect. I can animate now. But there was a small problem. I couldn't animate. And not because I wasn't good at animating. It was, well, probably I was. But the point of the matter was, there were no jobs available for animation. All of the jobs were here in South Korea. So as a result, I had to learn the first stage, pre-production, which means I was a character designer, and I would design the storyboards. Now, as I developed my skills in pre-production, I started to get frustrated because there was such a lack of knowledge and understanding of what happens in this country with animation, because we only do pre-production. So much that I started asking myself some questions. Who were the animators? Where were the animators? What were their names? Why was it in another country? Why do we call ourselves an animation studio if we don't animate our own shows? And furthermore, why was it so far away? I became inundated with these questions. And after a while, I started asking producers and directors within the field what the issue was. And I got, unfortunately, some mixed results. Some had a vague understanding of it. They had some experience. The others, no idea. So after a while, I decided I needed to get strong answers, concrete evidence. And that is how I met Mr. Yu Gion. This is Yu Gion. Yu Gion is one of the nicest individuals I've ever met in my career of animation. Yu Gion is responsible for the reason why I've even made it to Korea. Yu Gion is from Seoul, born here. He moved to Hollywood about four years ago to pursue an animation and a career in animation like me. So, you know, we were both doing character designs and storyboards. And after a while, I started to grill you. I started to ask him questions. And one day, I got the courage to turn around to him, and I said, Yu Gion, I have made a decision. I want to move to Korea and quit my job here and learn animation. And Yu Gion was really cool. He looked at me and he said, No, me just so. Now, I didn't know what that meant. I didn't know Korean. But it sounded like he was excited, right? So I said, OK, this is great. <laughs> so you know, we continue to talk. I start to grill him a little bit more and uh, get some questions out of him. And after a while, he decided to be fortunate to meet Jung Mi. Now, Jung Mi was an old friend of his. Jung Mi owns one of the greatest animation studios in South Korea. She's the president. And she came to Warner Brothers, where, you, where Yu Gion and I worked. And it was a great opportunity for Yu Gion to introduce me to her. So he finally introduced me to Jung Mi, and I gave her my proposal. I said, Jung Mi, I want to move to your country and work at your studio and quit my job here. And Jung Mi was so nice. She looked at me really nice, and she said, oh, no, me too so? <laughs> they both said the same thing, right? So I was convinced that I had made the right decision. <laughs> so as time moved on, you know, Jung Mi, I pestered her some more. And she eventually said, hey, listen, I'm really impressed with your general interest in our culture in coming to our studio. Americans don't normally do that. If you can get your stuff together and get out here, I'll sponsor your visa. I said, perfect. My friends thought I was absolutely crazy. And then there came the questions from them. Dude, why do you want to move to Korea? <laughs> oh, are you going to move to Korea? You know, are you going to be able to make enough money out there? What if you fail? Do they have McDonald's in Korea? 
They're my friends. What can I do? <laughs> Needless to say, they spent so much try, time trying to convince me not to go to Korea, and all I could see were the reasons why I should go. To learn another culture, to learn the entire process, to get respect from the Korean animators, because they don't talk with Americans. They just do the work. And just to get a broader perspective, I was convinced. I got my paperwork together, and I flew to Korea. When I landed in Korea, however, it was a completely different experience. I never felt more unwelcome as a citizen than I did when I arrived in Korea. It was the worst six months of my entire life. I hadn't predicted any of this. First of all, I'd made so many mistakes. I didn't practice Korean, of course. I'd never been here. Why do I need to know Korean? So I couldn't speak it. I couldn't read it. I couldn't write it. So I couldn't communicate with anyone. I got sick from the transition of American food to Korean food. I was homesick. I got lost in my neighborhood seven times a day before I got to my office. I was late every day. I hadn't anticipated these kinds of mistakes. And as a result, I started to convince myself that this was a bad idea, that I was a complete failure, and I was alone and away from my family. So it got to a point so bad that, and I'm embarrassed to say this, but I was crying in my apartment in Kazandong, alone, looking in the mirror at 4 in the morning, saying to myself, no, me <laughs> It was the only words I knew. But it made perfect sense, right? I was tired of being crazy. I was tired of being challenged. All of my romantic ideas of this country were shattered. And I was completely ready to go back home. I wanted to get my first ticket back home, fly back to America, be normal again, enjoy California, the palm trees, the burritos, McDonald's. And I considered myself a failure. Now, that story was three years ago. But I stayed. And I stayed because Ryu spoke to me. And I can't remember what he said, because it was in Korean. But it sounded like I should stay. And I did. And I failed some more, and more, and more. And I wanted to go back home several times. But I stuck through it. And three years later, here I am as one of the most respected foreign animators in this Korean animation industry. Everyone knows me. I'm here now producing a television show. <laughs> Not only that, but I learned a little bit of Korean, even though it's the level of a small child genius, but it's, it's pretty good. And, you know, honestly, I built some wonderful relationships. I became friends with some of the best presidents of Korean animation studios here. I even formed a co-production with my own company, with one of the top studios here, to hopefully develop some content that can bring revenue into the Korean industry, because there's no market for animation here. I did a lot of crazy things. Michuso. But what I did learn was that crazy people run this world, really, you know? It's all the crazy people that make us move forward, right? And I'm not saying I'm, you know, a pioneer, but I'm just saying that it's small steps, right? It's the crazy people that make us change our minds. You know, some guy said, hey, let's put a four wheels on a cart and ride and when people wanted to walk. You're crazy. Some guy said, hey, we can fly to the moon. You're crazy. We can take metal and bend it into a tube and put wings on that and jets and fly across to other continents inside of a few hours. That guy was crazy whoever came up with that idea. But those ideas, those people, those are the ones who are not afraid to accept failure. And what I've learned in this story, this short story, is that you have to anticipate failure if you intend to innovate. Nothing happens if you don't try. And although I was a fish out of water in this country, I didn't let my shortcomings stop me. Thank you, Ryu. I didn't let my shortcomings stop me. And I learned from those mistakes. And I think one of the biggest lessons I can get out of this is you have to think about the decisions you make and how any decision you make that's based on your dreams is worth it. Nothing worth having comes easy. And you also have to remember, and I think, which is the most important lesson I learned, 
was that you have to be willing to do what others won't to achieve what others don't. Comes on me, Doc. Huh? 